So welcome. Uh, I'm again, John Zeidler from the National Weather Service Austin San Antonio office. We're located up in New Braunfels. Um, if you've been through the, uh, and I suppose many of you have been through the, the initial Master Naturalist course, uh, generally we come down and, and, and speak to the chapter there on introductory weather and climate. Uh, and we do that every year. And we also do um, a variety of other presentations. One of the specialties I have that's even pretty rare for weather people is phenology, which we're going to talk about today's topic. I've got my uh, some of my contact information up there. Easiest thing uh, you, you you could get the uh, put the slides out ahead of time. If not, uh, uh, Stan uh, Dresden can be able to get them to you or David, uh, either one. Or if you just uh, one thing I tell a lot of people is just if you have your camera, uh, phone camera handy, just take a quick picture of this screen um, and you've got my contact information. Don't be shy. Uh, about uh, e emailing me. Um, if you call me, it's going to be a little, um, I'm juggling a few balls right now at the office. We had some folks retire at the end of the year. So if you call me, you're probably going to get my voicemail, but I will would call you back eventually. <laughs> um, but, you know, we're, uh, we're part of the federal government and you pay your tax dollars every year. So uh, you'll definitely utilize uh, our weather service, especially this time of year with, with just the variety of weather we're having. Um, from hot to cold, um, uh, sort of the joke I've seen recently going around is the Texas weather is like Powerball numbers, you know, 85, 25, 68, you know, it's, it's, uh, it goes up and down uh, this time of year, especially. Well, let's uh, get right on into it then. Let me go to the next uh, slide. Now, this is a video <coughs> of um, a, a gentleman uh, took sort of a time lapse um, in his backyard. And phenology is really, one thing we like to call it is nature's calendar. Uh, so it's basically how do plants and animals react to changes primarily of sunlight, but also weather. And that would be temperature would be the big driver, but also precipitation, even humidity uh, can be a factor, even atmospheric pressure can be a factor. So as, as you're all pretty familiar, if you're from somewhere other than South Central Texas, there are seasons, you know, down here, we pretty much have more like two seasons, sort of a warm season and a cold season. But in other places, you get, you know, sort of four distinct things, winter, fall, spring, and summer. And of course, the, the various plants and animals and, and, uh, and the changes they're going through is, is something uh, that you see. So a uh, base definition of phenology is it's the recurring plant and animal life cycle stages and their timing and relationships with weather and climate. All right, we're gonna go through a lot of examples about this, but uh, this is you know, something, it's, it's the way nature's operated uh, you know, for eons uh, primarily. And it, it's pretty interesting. And I think as you'll find, as we go through the presentation, you actually know quite a bit or you observe quite a bit. There's a lot of things, um, and especially if, if you ever uh, you know, spoke with your, your grandparents primarily, I would say you know, generations, let's say before, uh, I don't know, before certainly uh, you know, electricity, television, and radio. So my grandparents were born in like the 1910s. So you know, when they were born, there was no electricity, basically. Um, you know, or, or radio or television. So back in those days, people, you know, sort of had to learn a lot more things. You either read it or you had to, you know, just do it through your observations. Now, of course, we've got all kinds of technological tools to assist us, and we'll, we'll talk about some of them too, but you can always just use your eyes and your ears uh, are really important. Um, so another way to look at it, um, besides being this recurring life cycle changes, is it's a calendar. Um, and in fact, a lot of times, um, especially if, if you have some, again, ancestors, uh, or if yourself maybe grew up on a farm or a ranch um, or are, are very uh, interested in gardening, for example, you know these kind of things. You know that there's certain life cycles, you know. Um, again, down here in South Central Texas, we don't have um, as regular uh, freezes. They tend to be sporadic. Um, places where I grew up in Minnesota, there's very clearly a time that you're going you're gonna, to uh, plant your garden. You know, if, if you try to plant your garden at the first, the first time snow is finally melted, you know, um, you're probably going to get a bad surprise. You're probably going to get a late snowstorm or a freeze and you're going to have to start over. So there's certain things. And again, you can track these kind of things uh, with, through a calendar, which is how people did it in the old days. Um, so the, the fancy terms, and I'm sorry, we're science people. Science people use fancy terms just because they want to use fancy terms. <laughs> but basically, uh, phenophases is the fancy term for life cycle events. So what's life cycle events? So for animals, it's what activity are they doing? Are they migrating, breeding, um, eating, sleeping, hibernating? You know all these kind of things. Reproductive uh, states. You know um, where, when are when are their new generations born, and what's the what's the how are they raised? Is it is it a short cycle, a long cycle? And then development. How do they mature? 
um, you know, from, from, you know, just hatching from the egg or being born all the way up to, to full adulthood. For plants, uh, same kind of thing. If you assume we start like this time of year in the winter, um, you know, obviously things like coniferous uh, pine trees and that don't lose their, their needles. But for most trees, they don't have leaves right now. And so the, the budding and then eventual leaf production, and then shortly thereafter with a lot of plants, you have flowering. And then eventually with some, obviously trees and so forth, uh, apple trees and whatnot, you've got the fruiting. And so the, so, so the uh, phases uh, that you can follow. Um, to look at it on a timeline, another way of looking at this is again, starting here in the winter, we would progress through a spring and a summer and a fall. And so not only does each individual plant or animal have its own sort of cycle, but then generally all do. So in other words, basically all of the trees in Texas are gonna develop their buds and their leaves coming up here, you know, in a month or so, a month and a half. You know, and by the time we get to next fall, they're basically all gonna drop their leaves about the same time. Again, you have a variance amongst different, different types of trees. Uh, different plants and those migrations is a big thing we're going to see just shortly here and again in about another i don't know maybe maybe even uh, just barely a month from now you're going to start to see some of the birds starting to migrate back uh, back north for the, the the birds that do migrate so these kind of things um you can look at it in, in a timeline sense um again what are the important life cycle events um it, it's a little bit like uh like with people um you know if, if you look at yourself in the mirror every day you don't notice you know, that you, you don't see that you think like kids, you don't see that you're growing much. But if you don't see somebody, especially like your kids, if you don't see your grandparents for maybe, um, I don't know, three or four months, also like, wow, you're growing a lot, right? Because they, they see that difference from before. So again, we're tracking sort of the major things. You can look day to day, but a lot of, a lot of times there's not really a big day to day change. Scientists have generally done that though, for probably almost every plant or animal species just so they can fill in you know sort of the scientific background but but the main things is what we're looking at when do eggs hatch when are young born when do the um when do the first fruits appear on the tree those those kind of things what we're looking at um the other way to look at this and this um this is again helps I mean, one of the neat things about phenology is there's as you see there's different ways of looking at it. another way to look at it is on a calendar sense this is the first way i was introduced to it uh there's a group called the freshwater society in minnesota and one of the big fundraisers they had is every year they worked with the local one local TV uh, station meteorologists and they did a weather and phenology calendar and they still do uh, all these years later and, and I always got this was always one of my uh, Christmas presents or stocking stuffers was this calendar it was pretty big it was a little bit bigger like 11 by 17 kind of size really nice photography on it and everything but as you can see here you can mark down things so someone here is marked down on March 1st that they heard a cardinal for the first time or that on uh, March 3rd, they saw the daffodils popped up, you know, this kind of thing. And so you can keep track of this. And what's really cool is you could do this for your own yard. And especially if you're really big in, into, into a garden, gardening and, uh, and, and uh, flowers and this kind of thing, you know, you can track for yourself. Um, you probably have a pretty good, this is where I get what I mentioned before, is you probably have a pretty good knowledge already if you've been doing that for a while, uh, you know, what time, you know, you can look at a calendar and say, I think I'm going to plant about this time, or I think, you know, at this time I need to do whatever. And you can actually schedule that. And again, that's the way people did things uh, for thousands of years um, leading up, especially uh, farmers and ranchers. So why does this matter? Well, it's really, this is where the science has really advanced. And I'd say since World War II, even though some of the things were noted um, by people beforehand, since World War II, and, and as we have more just better communication and better data collection. So those biological interactions is, is really a, a hot topic right now um, because of uh, climate change, all right? Whether it be a, a local climate change or global climate change or just the trends back and forth, um, these interactions between plants and animals is really critical. And as, as you all probably know, um, pollination for plants is really critical on birds and bees, you know, primarily. Um, and if you don't, have those, or if there's some change in the life cycle of one or the other, you could have problems. And I'll cover some of these. I've got some examples later on in the presentation. So how does the whole food web work? You know, how do the, uh, so a good example, just stick with bees. Um, you know, there's a, obviously a very synergistic uh, pattern there between flowers and bees. And then of course for humans, it's honey production from bees, right? Then we get honey. And again, you, if you interrupt any part of that, it, it can affect the larger um, scale, um, just competition. So one of the things we're seeing uh, is you may have uh, two different types of birds, let's say, 
and they both are attracted to a similar kind of plant. Well, if one of the birds um, arrives to say a little bit, they, they, from the migration, they arrive a couple weeks earlier than the other one, then eventually the other one's not gonna find any food, right? Uh, and then it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna have to move on or, 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 uh, or uh, die out. So that's the kind of thing you're starting to see. And, and that can get, that's what we talked about invasive species sort of fill in this category here too. Uh, growing season length, this is another one that's undergone a big change. Um, and, and this is where, when people talk about climate change and they get all wrapped around the wheels of, of well, if we don't do this or if we don't do that in a hundred years, it's gonna be this or that. Look, already we've seen substantial increases. There's nowhere in the United States that the growing season is shorter now than it was 50 years ago. There's nowhere, the Rocky Mountains, Florida, Maine, California. Everywhere it's longer by some amount. In some cases, maybe only a week. In some cases, up to three or four weeks. That makes a big difference. Again, where I grew up in Minnesota, um, there's almost no way you would plant anything before April 1st. You wouldn't even dream of it. Um, May 1st would even be, you know, a little iffy. I mean, you'd be you'd be worried about if, if it was something you could bring the plants inside or something like just in your backyard, that's fine. But if you were planting like a farm or you're going to plant like a thousand acres of corn or something, you, you wouldn't even dream of doing that on April 1st. Now that's very common because that growing season, the last freeze in the, in the winter is usually done by about the first or second week of March. Um, a good example down here in, in, uh, in our part of Texas, um, if you go look back in the 60s, 70s and 80s, even as, as just as re recent as that, we had pretty regular freezes. Now it's pretty rare down here in, uh, in the San Antonio area um, we might get what, maybe five days a year. Some years we have no freeze at all. And so again, that can have a really big impact. And so places um, where the, you wouldn't have, and the, where it really comes in is think of somewhere like the country of Canada, right? So Canada is completely north of the US, so even colder. Well, there's some uh, crops, for example, you might plant that have to have a certain amount of time to mature, right? And if the growing season is too short, you wouldn't even like, hey, we can't plant it. It's either going to get frozen in, when we plant it, it's going to get frozen to harvest. Well, now as climate change changes now in Southern Canada, they're starting to plant some crops that they've never able to even try before. So that's another, another factor. Um, human health is a big one. You can might tell I'm a little bit uh, uh, allergy <laughs> impacted myself. The mountain cedar is out. Um, and, and again, that's, that's a huge impact um, on, on when, things, when things develop or don't develop. Uh, so one of the things we're seeing, and you all might be experiencing this, is because we're having fewer freezes and because we're having, especially during a La Nina year like this year, drier conditions, then when we do have the pollen season, it's just much worse. It really is compared to if it was raining quite a bit, um, you know, which would tend to wash it out a little bit. Um, so you're starting to see a big effect there. Also, you're seeing uh, with uh, mosquitoes are a big uh, vector uh, of carrying diseases. Um, so I'm, I wouldn't worry about malaria so much here, but Zika virus, a variety of viruses generally because mosquitoes are tapping right into your, right into your skin, um, but can be other, other things as well. But th we're seeing changes uh, like that occurring on. Um, again, sensitivity to global change. The thing I like about this, and especially talking to your group is, is again, when I try to, I do a climate change presentation, be more than happy to do that, but it tends to get, it's hard to do that without a lot of numbers and a lot of graphs and people's eyes just glaze over. This is something that you can just go see with yourself. I mean, this is, you can see in your own backyard, because again, if you keep track of it on that, on a calendar like that, you know, over 10, 20, 30 years, you know, you're going to see patterns develop. And it's not me, not me or some science person telling you, you can see it with your own eyes. So I, that's what I like about this is it really helps get that connection um, uh, to nature with, with people that I think sometimes, of course, in the modern people growing up in cities, they sort of lose that, that connection to sort of these natural cycles. Anyway, let's move on to the next slide. So for the fall, which we just came through, of course, the sunlight decreases and, and our, our shortest day of the year was back on December 21st, 22nd. So the days are shorter, so less sunlight. Um, daylight savings time isn't really a big deal. That's for humans, but the plants don't really know what time of the day it is. They just know how much sunlight is. Um, of course, it's cooler. Water freezes, at least down here occasionally. Again, some places like the northern part of the U.S. that's frozen, you know, for uh, maybe three months straight. Um, obviously, uh, plants tend to change their color, especially their leaves. The leaves eventually drop. Um, if there's any nuts or fruit on the trees, they probably drop. Then the plants, most of them go dormant. Um, crops are harvested in the fall. 
So think of how that changes the environment. If I've got a full large field of corn or soybeans or wheat, and then all of a sudden now it's gone, it's, it's, it's just flat, you know, almost just soil. Um, think of the change, local change in the environment that, that has. And then again, animals change their behavior. Quite a few of them migrate, um, a fair number hibernate. Um, some of them, uh, I've, one of our cats, he builds up uh, a bit of a furry coat. The other two don't, but for some reason he does during this time of year. And the animals, you know, uh, tend to rely on food stores. For springtime, and of course now we're just about to come into spring, the uh, sunlight increases, days get longer, temperatures are getting warmer, um, plants begin to, to start uh, coming out of their dormancy, they bud, uh, leaves form, green up we call it, um, and then eventually a flowering, and uh, of course we plant uh, field row crops. Animals do get more active, um, they migrate in or out, again from our area we're more of a pass-through uh, area so much um, that, uh, you know, we do have some overwintering of birds uh, in our area, but mostly we're a, we're a passer. I, one of the things that I always track every year is when the butterflies come back south in the late summer, early fall. That's one of the ones that, that's where I sort of know fall is coming. That's just my own personal one. And again, animals get more active, um, build nests, you know, the young get born generally in the, in the springtime. And again, that's nature's way of understanding that if you're going to, if you're going to have young, um, it's better to have them born right before the, the season with the warmest temperatures and the most food, right? If, you're, if you have your young born the first day of fall, they're probably not going to make it through the winter, you know? So that's, that's a, a good deal of how things have evolved over time. With that. And then my wife, I put this in there for her because school gets done. So <laughs> it doesn't have any impact on plants or animals, maybe other than kids uh, climbing in the trees. So what are some of the life cycle events we keep track of? Well, we already saw some examples of this. So a good example are uh, daffodils uh, or any kind of plant blooming. Um, first time you might see a bird or animal uh, in the area, especially if it's migratory. Um, frogs, you notice you don't hear a lot of frogs this time of year, and whereas in the middle of the summer on a, on a late night, you will. And then again, the leaves turning color and, and falling off in the fall. So here's a good example. Um, now, one of the things about the, uh, the U.S., of course, is we're a relatively a uh, young country still. I mean, uh, we're coming up on our 250th anniversary and people have, have lived about 400 years, I guess, if you go back to Plymouth Rock. <laughs> but we don't have really long-term good records. Now, I'll show you some from you know, later in the presentation. Some countries like Japan or China, we have records that go back a couple thousand years, which is a whole, whole different thing. But at any rate, they've taken, when do the birds, this American woodcock is an example, when does it arrive in Dutchess County, New York? All right. And so you can see back in in the 1880s on the left side of the graph over here that they used to not arrive until day 120. Now, this is what's called Julian date of the year. All Julian date is, is you, 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 you just what day of the year, basically from January 1st. So January 1st is day one. December 31st is day 365. So when it says day 120, well, that's four months. All right. So that's January, February, March, April. So Day 120 is basically May 1st, if you want to look at it that way, okay? So they used to arrive around May 1st, but look at this, over this 100 and, uh, 120 some years, by the year 2000, now they're coming at day 60, which is March 1st, uh, you know, right? Basically, so that's a, that's a big change. I mean, that's a huge change uh, in that local area. Now, that's just to this local area. If you have the exact same bird, American woodcock, and you know, we pick some other location, I don't know, say Detroit, Michigan, or somewhere, it may be different. It may not be as as uh, steep as this as this change. But this gives you an idea of some of the uh, some of the change that's going on. Is birds showing up almost two months earlier uh, than what maybe somebody's grandparents would have told them? You know, if you would have asked, in, if you would have been born in let's say 1920, and you would have asked your grandparents, "Hey, when do the woodcocks normally show up?" Yeah, they show up about May 1st. And then by the time you got to be talk, talk to your grandchildren in 2000, you'd be like, well, no, it's actually March 1st now. See, and that, that's that kind of a change just within one person's lifetime. So again, some of the metrics we use, and, and I do have some repetition here just to, to, it's one way I found for, to help you really remember this. But again, we don't have to just use our eyes. We can use things like satellite. So one of the things we do is we do have the, the uh, satellites we can look at how green does the surface look from above? And you'll see this on the satellite, especially during um, the springtime. Uh, senescence, when the leaves fall off, um, the maximum of the growing season, we can, we can see that, what is the timing? So again, it's, 
there, you know, the U.S. itself is just a huge country, and we could get reports from a bunch of people, right? We could have every farmer check off some some uh, online form and send it in. But also, by the satellite allows us to get to even to, to see what's going on in areas that are somewhat unpopulated. So think somewhere high up in the Rocky Mountains, you know, in the wilderness. Basically, we can see even then how things are going on. But there are a lot, a lot of other metrics uh, we available too. So let's just look at one example here with the lilac. So as you can see, here's some of the different phases. Uh, that we see, you know, from buds through young leaves, flowers to full flowering. All right, so that's that's a good example. So really cool thing, and this is somewhat prior to the the computer and internet age. So this gentleman here, Dr. Joe Capri, was at Montana State, and he had this really cool idea. Starting in the 1950s, he recruited about 3,500 3, backyard scientists, i.e., master naturalist kind of people, right? <laughs> and he said um, he cloned a bunch of lilac plants, sent them to him. They said, hey, would you mind planting this in your yard? So they did. And then every year he had them send him postcards. You see them there in the lower uh, lower right there. He had them send a postcard tracking those various dates. You know, when did it bloom or when did it bud? When did it flower? This kind of thing. And what he was able to do was draw these pretty cool maps. You can see the dots there represent all the people he sent the cards to. And then all he did was draw the lines, you know, where they, they were all the same. So this, like up in Canada here, this 130 line was, that's everybody, that's about where the, 130 days into the year. So again, about May 1st, um, that was the first leaf date. But you can see how it progresses north, you know, down in Oklahoma and Arkansas here at the bottom. Notice it was it was basically day 60, so roughly March 1st, whereas up in Canada, it was roughly May 1st. And you can see that progression. You see it gets really complicated in the Rocky Mountains because again, you've got all these elevation changes and, and it's gonna depend a lot what elevation you are. But I thought this was really cool, a real simple project. All, all you had to do was just have a bunch of postcards and a bunch of postage, right? That's a really, I mean, I'm, I'm just as a science kind of person, I'm pretty impressed that somebody had such a, a, a very simple, doable repro, um, approach, you know, to so, you know, no computer modeling or all this, all this crazy stuff. It was just a simple, hey, let's get a bunch of people to report what's going on. So there's a lot of things, a lot of things like this. Um, as an example, this was uh, one of the sites uh, out in California. And again, now this is from 1960 to 1990. And you can see on the left there, it started about day 105. And then even over just this 30, 40 years, it got down to about day 100. Okay. So again, but, you know, it's not, it's not as maybe as steep of a, of a change as we saw with that, that woodcock in New York. But again, you know, it's a change. And again, there's variability. It's not, it's not a straight line every year. Some years are, are maybe a little bit warmer. And so things get started a little earlier. But again, the trend is what you're, what you're looking at. Um, especially again, you know, if it's just you in your backyard, you have a lot of control over things. But, but imagine now that um, I almost think out like Fredericksburg, like the big wildflower place out there. You know, if you're that, if you're the operator of that, boy, you really want to know this kind of information, right? You know, you really want to plan. You don't want to tell people, hey, come out for our big blue bonnet festival. And then they come out and the blue bonnets aren't developed yet, right? That's not good for business. So there's a lot of things uh, that ride on this for some people. All right. So again, um, uh, some more examples, um, animal emergencies, so cicadas, right, are, are another. We had a big brood of those, uh, if you all remember, last, last summer um, across the whole U.S., especially in the eastern U.S. Again, anytime you see animals, uh, you see them for the first time, you hear uh, the, the, um, uh, the birds in the nest, you know, as an example. Migratory is really, really big, and especially there's all, and, and it's not just land-based things. So think of salmon returning to their uh, birthplaces to spawn whales. That's a big thing. Whale watching, uh, especially along the West Coast, um, insects, birds. It's 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 pretty much everything's tied together. That's another point. Um, here's again another example, and you can see again budding, flowering, and then fruiting. Uh, so you can see this again with almost any plant or animal is going to have these phenophases or these life cycles uh, that you can track. Um, here's another way again to look at it. Same type of thing I just showed you, but now we've put a calendar to it. All right, and so again, you could do this kind of thing year after year, and you could you could plot things down, see how things are going, and it, it's really nice predictive tool, right? Even for your own backyard, just to have an idea, you know, how are my tomatoes coming along versus previous years, you know, that type of thing. So here's two, a couple more examples: Joshua tree and red elderberry. And again, the people that are familiar with these, uh, and you'll see here, I've got the a couple more slides down the road. We'll show you where this really gets to be a big money kind of thing. Again, lilac, elderberry, rhododendron. So um, all any anybody that's got a, a special interest in any kind of a, a plant or animal species, you're going to notice. Um, I'm, I'm sure a fair number of your group, I've given uh, 
some uh, talks to the Texas Ornithological Society and different birding groups. I'm sure quite a few of you are interested in that too. Obviously, this is very, you know, same kind of thing. You know, you definitely want to keep track of that. And especially if you wanted to see, um, you know, down in South Texas, for example, this time of year down the Brownsville area, you know, you really wanted to go down on a birding trip. You certainly wouldn't want to want to set that up for the week after they've all migrated north or something, right? If, if, if that thing were to occur. So here's where it starts to get a little bit practical. So let's take a look at um, gypsy moths. So gypsy moth eggs um, over the millennia have, have adapted or developed that they generally hatch when the red buds bloom. Well, that's because the gypsy moth like the red buds. So here's the problem. What if the red buds start blooming earlier and earlier and they, they bloom at a faster rate than the gypsy moths can change as an example. So in other words, the red buds bloom and then they get past the stage where the gypsy moths can't eat them anymore. Gypsy moths come out, there's no food, right? A good other good example is hummingbirds and red buckeyes. And we don't have a lot of red buckeyes in this area, um, but that's another example. So what we're starting to see with climate change are these mismatches where for millennia, either the, the, the plant or the animal has adapted. Most times it's the animal adapting to the plant, but then all of a sudden, if one of them is changing faster than the other, you've got a problem. In fact, I just uh, read this week, an article had come out um, studying, I think it was a couple of hundred different species, and they've estimated that the change in animal migrations or, or animal presence now will prevent about 60% of plants from having that symbiotic relationship. In other words, the animals are gone or moved on or whatever, aren't there when the plant is ready for them, basically. Because the animals, again, are much more migratory, right? I mean, they can they can get up and, and fly or walk. Uh, I don't know about you, I haven't seen many oak trees pick up their pick up their uh, trunk and start walking, right, <laughs> to move north. And so if, if, the, if the plants are relying uh, for either pollination or, or movement or, or anything, on the animals, that, that's going to become uh, more difficult. So this is a little joke, and I will take a rest here for a second. Let y'all think, those of you who like puns, like this one. David, did we have any questions? Um, well, we had someone ask about uh, if anybody's noticed other animals um, shedding kind of as a sign of, of the season changing. Um, Well, I'll say scientists have. I mean, as your group, uh, I don't know, but but yeah, there, yeah. There's definitely there's definitely uh, you know seasonal changes. I, I actually notice, and I see David's got a little bit more of a. Of, I've just got a goatee. He's got more of a full beard, but I do notice, and you probably notice this. Even even a lot of men tend to carry more of a beard, you know, during the winter time. Um, I know one guy in my office. Basically, what what happens is is if you want to think of it this way, is he is he he. We get about the first 90 degree day, he goes completely clean shaven, maintains that through the summer, and then Labor Day, he basically does not shave after Labor Day. And so by the time we get like, you know, to Easter or so, you know, he's got a pretty big beard. That's just his pattern for doing things, you know. So sometimes even with people, it can be that way. All right, well, we'll move on then if we have no other questions. Uh, we also have one more oh. person uh, mentioned that yep. uh, they read an article yesterday that the monarchs had been staying later. Um, and I noticed that as well. I had caterpillars in my yard um, mm -hmm. in December. I still had a caterpillar trying to trying to make it work. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So I had mentioned this earlier. This was another study that uh, just came out this past year. So it says February eighth. That's that's in twenty twenty one. But notice here, the pollen season um, basically nationwide is is on average twenty days earlier and ten days longer. And also, so not only is it starting earlier, lasting longer, but then it's 21% more pollen, like more volume. You know, they do that pollen counts, you know, that you've seen, you know, on the news. So uh, in other words, uh, if, if, if you think your allergies are worse or that people seem to have more allergy problems than they did, you know, back when you were a kid, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm 55. So let's say when I was a kid 50 years ago, if I think, gee, it seems like more people have allergy problems in 50 years ago, well, that's, that's actually a, a reason for that. It's not just in people's head, um, it's actually more so. So that's not good news for those of us, especially with the mountain cedar here uh, in the Austin, San Antonio area. All right, so here's an example. <coughs> Again, now we use this uh, interesting um, thing here. I'm gonna introduce the concept of what's called degree days. So you see this DD50 there at the bottom. 
So it's a way of, of keeping track of basically energy inputs. So what we do is you take the average temperature for each day. So let's example, let's say, for example, um, today here in San Antonio, the high is going to be 60, the low was 40. So the average temperature would be 50, right on the money, right? So we would count zero then, because the difference between that 50 and, and the, our standard is zero. Let's say tomorrow the average, the average temperature came out to be 52, we would count two units, two positive units of energy. So there's been studies, and this, this kind of scientific method has been around, I'd say, since maybe the 1920s and 30s, by counting up those energy units, if you will, okay, then you, you can tie that to these uh, changes in the plants or animals. So for example, in Ohio, using a, a, a 50 benchmark, you'll see one of the plants there, the gold tide, uh, uh, forsythia, I guess, my forsythia, I guess that's better. It only needed 74 of those units to bloom. Whereas if you look at the Rose of Sharon Blushing Bride, it took 1,529, which is a huge amount. In other words, the, the top one there is going to flower a lot earlier in the spring than the one at the bottom. Now, some of you may have heard um, or you've seen many calculations of energy bill. You can do the same thing for your home heating and cooling. We call them heating and cooling degree days. So again, if you like to set your thermostat, let's say it's 72, you know, if the outside temperature of that day, let's say in the summertime averaged 80, then we count eight degree, we call them degree days of cooling to cool your house to what you would like your house at. See, so it's the same kind of thing. But again, you can keep track of this. So this, this again helps us keep track of these things um, because if you just try to do it with temperature, sometimes you can get fooled a little bit. Um, as you might remember a week or two ago, we had those nice cool mornings, but then in the afternoons we were getting up near 80 degrees. Sometimes people, like your memory might be, I remember the morning was cool, but if you actually look at the average temperature that day, it was mostly, most of the day it was warm. It was really, and you don't even have to use the high and the low, you can use the hourly temperature. Sometimes that gives you a better feel for it. At any rate, this is the kind of thing, again, there's all lots of research. You can reach out to Texas um, A&M AgriLife Extension and for just about any plant, they're gonna have this kind of information on. And again, it gives you uh, a, a little bit better trying to pinpoint you know, exactly. Let's say you wanted to um, go on vacation and you wanted to you wanted to make sure you weren't on vacation when your tomatoes were really going to be like perfectly ripe. You know, that kind of thing. You could sort of plot, plot that out a little bit. Look at our weather forecast from the weather service and maybe, you know, know that you should go on vacation, you know, a week or two earlier, maybe, you know, in a certain year so that you, you didn't have them, you know, coming to full ripeness right when you were gone. But anyway, so this kind of stuff's been done for various plants and various uh, temperature thresholds. So this is where I was telling you about the big money. So all this stuff's cool in your backyard. Well, um, I don't know if anybody on the group's had a chance to go see the cherry blossoms, uh, especially in, in Washington. And if you've been to Japan, I, it's on my bucket list to go to Japan one of these years to do it too. But they that's big business. There's a ton of people that want to go. And it's a very short period. It's maybe about a week that, they're, that these uh, blossoms from when they pop out to when they're full and then they're basically done. It's, it's a very short period. And you can see the park service here. Um, now this is from uh, 2011, um, but they actually post on their website, you know, when the, excuse me, they use those degree days in that to predict um, when the bloom is gonna be. Because again, you'd, you'd be heartbroken if you showed up and you made plans to go to Washington DC and you showed up and oh, sorry, it was last week. It'd be like, geez, thanks a lot, right? So they try to predict all that. Now, the cool thing is, is again, getting back to records in Japan at the uh, one uh, monastery there, they've taken observations since the year 800. Think about that. That's a tremendously long period. So you can see, and again, uh, your scale here is what day of the year was the peak day. So again, back in the early part of the period or for most of the period, really, the average date is around day 100. So if you think about it, 30 days in a month. So it's about the middle of March, maybe March 15th or so, right? But notice what's happened here in about the last um, 200 years. Notice now we're almost down to about day 90, you know, so we're, we're getting, I'm sorry, check that March, uh, 100 and some is April, middle of April, my bad. <laughs> but notice now though, we're starting to get down to, to under 100, okay? So now we are getting into, into March. And so it's getting earlier and earlier. And again, this is something we've had long-term records. So again, a lot of people get wrapped up in the whole climate change debate and all that. And, and they worry about all kinds of, things. you know, this is something, you know, I guarantee you the monks in 800 weren't trying, they had no political agenda or anything like this. They were just, you know, tracking stuff down, you know, it's historical observations. So this is the kind of thing that, like I said, it really helps people see 
the, the changes you, you know that we're seeing. A lot of other stuff about climate change is very speculative. Whether or not we'll have more hurricanes or stronger hurricanes or more tornadoes or more drought, a lot of that is 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 uh, hard to tell, unknowable. <clears throat> but this is the kind of stuff that's like I said, just just plain and simple. You can just see. Uh, for yourself to change, at least in that area, for that specific kind of thing. But again, this is this is where it gets to be a big, a big money kind of thing. I know it. Um, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, the uh, national park there in eastern Tennessee. I've totally lost <laughs> lost my mind. But they've got um, they've got some uh, what is it? Uh, fireflies that come out. Uh, and so it's it's that uh, Smoky Mountains National Park. There we go, got it. But they have these fireflies that come out. Same kind of thing. It's a very short time frame. It's not like all summer long. You know, it's just a couple weeks. So you'll see this kind of stuff. One of the ones I'm familiar with is the sandhill cranes that go uh, up and down the flyway from uh, from I think it's uh, Central and South America through the U.S. Then they tend to stop in Nebraska, Central Nebraska area by the sandhills. And again, it's just a, maybe a two week period. And these thousands and thousands of these huge, you know, they're, they're huge birds, and then they progress their way north. So um, again, this kind of thing uh, is really it, it has a financial impact uh, if you're somebody that uh, runs tourism in those areas. All right, so this is from Hayes County. Um, this just goes to show you the variation of of, um, of of barberry here. They have three different sites, okay. And Hayes County is very much like Bear County. The eastern part of it is is on the we call the coastal plains. And then there's a center part right along the escarpment, and then there's a part that's in the hill country. And you can see that the the flowering of these was quite a bit different to how much of the plant was flowered. You know, one of them peaked as early as uh, on the left here in red, March 15th. Another one peaked at the end of March. And then the one that was in the western part of the county didn't peak until April. And again, that's mostly due to elevation differences. You know, so even within one county, you can see it's almost a month's variation, right? So that's that, uh, so some plants, um, and some uh, animal activity may be that that local or that that much of a change. Other times, it's more common uh, throughout the entire county. Uh, here's uh, um, as you may know, there's the um, butterfly, uh, ladybird, um, uh, ladybird Johnson uh, wildflower area in that there in Austin. They track butterflies. Again, you can see there's some different peaks. Uh, uh, this is the diversity of different species, I guess. But you can see that there's different peaks. Uh, throughout the year. And again, that's either as things are hatching or migrating, right? So again, something, if you were making plans, now this is just um, this is just one year, okay? But if you have this for a number of years and you're like, hey, I'd like to go out when there's the most butterflies and the most different ones I can see, you know, there's certain times of the year you'd be, it'd be smarter to go out there than other times of the year, right? Okay, and then this gets back also to the allergy. Um, again, you see these kind of things with the tree pollens. Uh, that we're seeing uh, in general, I'll have to move this slide up by the other one, but again, it's more uh, longer pollen seasons and more pollen. So uh, that obviously has a, has a health impact. All right, so another uh, interesting example. So panda bears are pretty interesting. They only really eat two main types of bamboo, all right? So as you can see in the map there, this is a, and they're very focused in this one part of uh, central China. And you can see the two different kinds is the arrow and the umbrella bamboo, all right? And they grow at different, elevations. Um, and, and again, uh, the, 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 even though the bamboo uh, develops, these two species, it depends on the climate and the timing, which one is more prevalent, right? One versus the other. And so again, yeah, let me just go back to this. So if, if one of them, uh, I think here, let me just looking at the map here, this, the blue one, the umbrella bamboo, notice that that tends to be at lower elevations and the red at higher. So again, the pandas, at least in the wild, they're gonna have to move where the food source is. So and sometimes, again, you can see there might be a mismatch um, between the food sources. And if they have to travel a long way, you know, to go from say where the blue ones are down here in the, in the south part of the frame up to more of the red ones in the, in the western and northern, if that's a big deal, they're gonna expend a lot of energy having to basically migrate. Now it's not far, but again, you know, it's almost like, you know, telling one of us, like, you got to go climb a 14,000 foot mountain, you know, you're going to expend a lot of energy. So that, that could really, really reflect uh, in their reproduction and other things, if they end up basically spending all their energy just to get one food source to the other, whereas if both food sources, let's say, were, were prevalent in a given year. So some kind of this, this type of thing can be tracked as well. Another thing we use with satellite is uh, this normalized 
um, basically greenness index that we use. And again, you can see as the season goes on, it tends to be a big, a big sort of uh, change there from the spring right here at the start of the season to the end. We pretty much go from from a, a area of brownness or no development to full green pretty quickly. So that's the thing that again, most of us I think um, just because it's it's part of life and we don't notice it. But if you think about it, we really go from a state of looking dormant in the winter to a state of full green up in spring. And a lot of that really happens just in about a month. Okay, and sometimes I, I think we just get caught we don't notice it. Uh, as much I know I don't notice it as much here living in Texas as I did up in Minnesota where there was snow on the ground and absolutely everything but the evergreen trees you know was bare I mean there you notice a huge difference here it's a little more subtle because we're still getting a lot of sunlight you know and, and we still have a lot of the bushes and that there's you know a fair amount of greenness around but if you look at the trees um, you know you'll notice it that but it's a big change uh, we call it green up is, is sort of the term and and especially it's a thing that, um, as you may have seen, there's been some wildfires here uh, recently with some of these strong cold fronts and the high winds. Well, one of the things that, that helps the fire community out is when you have green up, when all the plants are dormant and the humidity is low and the winds are up, that really allows wildfire to spread. Um, once the trees basically get that green up and they start pulling water out of the soil, then all of a sudden the, the amount, the, the speed of which a wildfire spreads. And think of the grasses too, if they're dried out, cured brown grass, that's going to burn like kindling. Whereas once the grasses, you know, green up or start start um, their normal cycle again, then you know, basically it's like burning wet wood. You know, you're not going to get anywhere. So for the fire community, they're definitely following this kind of stuff. You know, just because they want to know exactly if, if the the threat for a wildfires. So again, in terms of fingerprints of climate, um, uh, here's here's an example again of of lilacs in Vermont. Again, on the top there, you can see that when when did they flower? And notice that that used to be about day 148. Now it's down to about day 140. And then leafing used to be about day 120 or so. And now it's down to about day 106. All right. And so the looking at it another way on the graph there, notice how um, what we've done is we've shifted the development cycle to earlier. So in the red there, it starts earlier. Notice in the winter, it doesn't get as cold, but now the warm season lasts longer. So again, these are the kind of things we're seeing is, is these phenological dates. Um, are, are becoming earlier, this, the growing season's lasting longer. And uh, like I said, you see this everywhere in the U.S. There's nowhere in the U.S. the growing season's getting shorter. There, there's, there's not a single location. Like I said, Rocky Mountains, Florida coast, uh, Seattle, doesn't matter. It's all getting longer um, to some extent, basically, is what we're looking at. So this is pretty cool, those of you who are uh, literary fans. So, of course, Thoreau was on the Walden Pond uh, back in the 1840s. And, you know, part of his deal was he wanted to be, you know, isolated and alone and think and all this. And that's great. But, uh, you know, when you're there, you can't just uh, think philosophical thoughts all day, basically. So what he did is he did like a lot of people used to do back before the modern times. You know, people used to have daily journals and that. And he just journaled all the different uh, plants and species. Well, what's interesting, of course, is we know exactly when he was there. So we have the record of it. So you can go out to Walden Pond now and you'll notice, for example, that 43 of the species he tracked um, now bloom seven days earlier than they did when he was there. Uh, blueberries flower 21 days earlier, as an example, um, and 27 of the species are no longer there. Things he described in his journal, they're not there anymore. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they've gone extinct. It might just be that uh, for whatever reason, they've, they've shifted to some other area. But this is really an important thing is we do have, again, when I talk about, um, if we take like satellite observations, well, the first satellite flew in 1960, weather satellite. So we have no satellite data from before 1960, as an example. And we look at upper air weather balloons. Um, those weren't really put up until after World War II. So that record only goes back to 1948, really. If we even look at just temperature records, okay, people with thermometers. So Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson took, took, uh, took weather observations. Well, okay, so great. Those go back to the 1760s, maybe, but not much more. So the thing that we do have, this uh, from that earlier slide with the Japanese monastery, is we do have observations. Places London, England, Paris, France, uh, Rome, uh, Italy, places where people took these observations, these phenological observations that, that go back. Even, even, in the, even in the Bible, you can find references uh, to, to some of these kinds of things. 
And so there gives us an idea how things have changed over much longer periods, you know, a couple thousand years versus, you know, 50 years. So it's an important thing that we have those, those types of things. And there is a whole line of research, um, people that uh, mostly historians and some weather people that go back, ships logs are a good example. So think of all the sailing ships back in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s. And then of course they had a ship's log every day, right? They would write down. And again, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, uh, advanced instrumentation. They would just write down, you know, it was a fresh wind today, the flag, the sails and flags were at full, full uh, extension and the seas were three men high or whatever, this kind of thing. But a lot of people are going back then and by taking all those ship observations and then plotting them and, and making, you know, timing them out. So if a ship here and a ship at another location reported about the same time, they're starting to reconstruct some weather patterns, which is pretty cool, pretty cool, interesting stuff. All right. So an example again um, of phenology. Now here we have photographs, okay? And photographs are important too, but I want you to take a look here. This is the leaf out. This is Lowell Cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts. A very common day in May of 1868. Look at the trees there. There's, there are no leaves at all yet. And that's the third, that's May 30th. I mean, that's, that's Memorial Day. That's pretty late. Again, it's Massachusetts, pretty far north. That was pretty common. Um, it wasn't like they had one cold winter that year. And now look at 2005. Look at the difference again in, in about 150 years. All right. Very big difference in what's going on there. Uh, and again, this is the kind of stuff from historical photographs. Um, one of the things that I saw a picture of, I used to work at the Rapid City, South Dakota office where Mount Rushmore is. So they went up on the hillside. Somebody had taken a picture in like 1909. Somebody took a picture in 1959. And then in 2009, they took a picture, right? So 50 years apart. And it was amazing the, the amount of difference, uh, you know, and on the same day, you know, because they had the dates the pictures were taken. It was amazing the difference, uh, you know, you you could see in, in, in some places. Some places climate change is, is actually very rapid, mostly in the Arctic and at higher elevations, tops of mountains and that. Um, we don't see, you know, the closer you get to the ocean and the closer you get to the tropics, you know, and, and so we're sort of halfway here in Texas, the, the less you see it because the dominance there uh, just the over dominance of the sun and the tropical environment and the oceans sort of mask it. But up in up in northern places like Alaska, northern Canada, northern Europe, you're, you're seeing some pretty substantial changes. So again, this is the change in the growing season. I already mentioned this across the entire uh, 48 United States, so not Alaska or Hawaii, but again, from 1895 to 2013, look at the change there. So if we took the average, which is the line, notice roughly about before World War II up to about uh, the late 1930s, we, it was cooler, okay? And then we stayed around normal till about 1980 and now notice how warm it's gotten, uh, or not warm, but how many more days. So the change from 1890 to 2020, the overall change is about 15 days, about two weeks uh, longer that the growing season occurs. And that's across the whole US. All right, so this is a really complicated graph. It's pretty straightforward if we just work from top to bottom. I already talked about this. This is what we call phenofit. And again, it's that, how do the plants and animals link up uh, for that synergy? So for example, um, what you're looking at is, 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 is something there that's this probability of presence. And the reason you wanna look for that is either reproductive success, can they basically reproduce or survival? So let's just go down the right side to survival. Notice that you've got things like uh, for drought or temperature. Okay, so again, that growing season is gonna make a difference here. All right, so that's there. But we go back to the left side for reproductive success. Well, you know, when does the fruit mature in the purple? Um, and, then the, and then those are the degree days there. That's the part that heats some. That's that degree days I talked about earlier um, that you can add up since flowering. If we go to the left in the orange, well, do you have frost damage on leaves? How hardy is a, is a plant to frost? So imagine it just gets to freezing just for an hour or two. Some plants are very sensitive to that, others aren't. If you fill all this in, you go down and you can build these models again of when things happen versus temperature, precipitation, the presence of other uh, animals, especially in a, in a pollination uh, kind of situation. So um, a good example here is oak trees that lose their leaves in the winter. Okay, so spring temperatures trigger the growth of the new leaves. The new leaves are edible to the caterpillars, okay, over the winter or before they moth out, but for about a month. After about a month, the leaves develop tannin, tannins, which make them inedible. So again, if the caterpillars don't emerge um, at the right time, then what would be a tremendously huge food source is basically poison. If you want to look at it, they just wouldn't eat it. They wouldn't necessarily eat it and die. They just wouldn't eat it. They, they basically would die of starvation. So again, you can see that if the 
if the oak tree starts its process earlier and for whatever reason the the caterpillars can't change uh, or adapt to that you're going to have a problem for the caterpillars not so much for the trees but for the caterpillars in that case so again here's an example of a, of a winter over moth and again they can only eat those early uh, trees and again that hatching date should be linked to the bud burst of the oak trees uh, you know just from nature over time but again if you have a, a situation where the climate is changing and not so much don't think global climate change in this case um, as in like the whole globe but just think of the san antonio think of what bear county was like 250 years ago compared to what bear county is like today right so you're going from maybe what 2,000 people or whatever lived here in 1800, right before the Alamo, you know, maybe 2,000 people lived in the entirety of Bear County, and now you've got 2 million people, and you've got this tremendous buildup of, of, uh, of housing and industry, and there's a urban heat island, we call it, so it's warmer in the downtown part of San Antonio than it is on the outskirts. So you can see just in the local area where there could have been a change like this, and then just due to the reproductive um, the genetics of caterpillars, maybe they can't adapt that quickly. I, I don't know. There's all kinds of studies um, for various species. There's scientists studying all of this. And some species are very adaptable and, and uh, can make very quick changes and others just can't. Um, you know, and if they can't, in, in a big sense, eventually they go extinct. Uh, but this is the kind of thing, again, where this, this phenology really comes into these ma matchings of, of, uh, of food sources and pollination and all that is really a synergistic effect. So uh, this is the great tit. Um, uh, mostly in Europe, they've noticed that uh, its migration to the European oak forest, again, depended on the caterpillars because they would use the caterpillars to feed their young. So now we've complicated even more, haven't we? So now if the oak trees are on a phase, then the caterpillars maybe aren't as many of them or they're smaller or die off. And now the great tit, the bird has a problem. So see, just one change in the oak tree, now we've moved up two different species are affected by that. This, this is where we talk about those food webs and the chain of, chain of food, this kind of thing. So you can see where it starts, it's starting to get to be a, a, a pretty big issue or, or a lot of things uh, are interrelated to each other. So here's another extreme mismatch. So uh, the, the fly, uh, pied flycatcher, it breeds in Northern Europe, but winters in West Africa. But again, the caterpillars um, used to hatch during the nesting season, but now they're hatching before the birds return from Africa. So this is a case where the caterpillars are reacting to the, the warmer temperatures. So they're like popping, you know, they're, they're basically, um, you know, hatching. Okay, great, they're out. But now the birds, for whatever reason, the birds aren't, aren't as um, dependent on the temperature. And so they're not getting the signal, hey, we should fly north. Maybe they're more keying on the sunlight as an example, which would be less changing. So now you got a problem as far as if, as if, if this is their preferred food, it's, by the time they get there, it's gone. They've already turned into, into moths and, and it's over with. So if we look at first leafing and first bloom, um, basically what I wanna show you is, is how things have, um, have basically changed in the day of the year. And, and pretty much what you're looking at uh, is on the top here, just, just look at the top and the colors. That's the day of year that you had the first leaf or sort of first bloom out on average. So again, in the southern part of the U.S., it was it was in February and March, and by the time we moved to the northern U.S., it was in April and May. By the time under most climate change scenarios, now we look at the look at the color scale at the bottom here. So by the time we get to mid-century here, 20 years from now, or what, 30 years from now, 2050, most places the uh, growing season or the day of year this stuff happens is going to move up anywhere from a week or two, 12 to 16 days. If we go to the end of the century, look, especially in the Rocky Mountains, you're going to move up almost a full month in some of these cases because of, of, uh, of warming. Now it's, um, you know, what the, what the impact of that is on the, on the plants and animals is gonna be highly variable, all right? There's not one, it, just because it's warmer um, at, the, at the end of the century, let's say, if we, if we go with our most average global warming projection, just because it's gonna be warmer, some plants or animals may thrive with that. And remember I talked about like the country of Canada, for example, Canada's, under a global warming scenario, Canada is generally going to have more of their land area in milder temperatures. In other words, they're going to be able to grow either different kinds of crops or more crops, and they may even actually have more uh, more um, uh, uh, birds and, and other migratory animals. Um, if you're a place that's already on the edge of sort of survival, so think about oh, let's say West Texas, like down by Big Bend. Well, see there, that might be it might be a pretty negative scenario. It might be hotter temperatures, not by too much. 
um, because it's already pretty hot to begin with. But we may just have a mega drought. It just doesn't rain for for years. And we've seen in the historical records some of these uh, back in the years uh, 1200s, they think there was a large drought that wiped out a large part of the native population throughout New Mexico, Arizona, you know, the Southwest, think of like Mesa Verde, if you've been out there, some of the uh, uh, ancestral Pueblos, that kind of thing. So in some places, climate change is gonna have a really dramatic impact. Other places, it might not be much noticeable at all. Um, you know, and again, it's gonna depend by species and, and the interactions they have. But just to give you an example for most of the US, here's an example for sugar maple under two different scenarios, okay? So uh, again, uh, so sugar maple, you know, just think your standard maple tree, maple syrup. You can see right now, if you look on the if you look on the left, okay, uh, the any place you see a dot is where there would be trees. So you can see they get down to just about northern Georgia, Tennessee, that area. But notice if we go under by the year 2100, if we warm to five five degrees Celsius, which is almost 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Notice anywhere in red, the sugar maple it will not be able to handle that. It will kill the plant. The plant's not not able to adapt that. Anywhere um, in yellow is probably going to be getting worse. Um, it, somewhere in the greens, maybe getting better. And notice, especially in the blue and the red, I'm sorry, the blue and the, uh, and the light green, I'm sorry, blue and the dark green, got to get it right here. It's actually going to get better. So notice in Canada there, how much of it's blue. So in other words, in Canada, they already have a lot of maple trees, but places further north where it's too cold currently for them to have good production, it's going to get better. Now, if we only, if the temperature raises, uh, 2.2 degrees, okay, um, but it's a but it's a faster rate of change, basically. In other words, it gets hotter quicker, but then levels off. Notice that you actually have more more of a uh, of an extinction there uh, in, near the Mississippi River. All right. So again, when we talk about climate change, people get real focused on what's the overall like. It's going to be five degrees warmer. Well, if I told you five degrees warmer, but it's going to be a degree a degree a decade, it's going to take 50 years to get there. That's one thing. The plants may be able to adapt that. But if I said it's going to be like this, it's going to go with five degrees. But yeah, it's going to go four degrees next year. And then it's only going to go one degree the next 50 years. See what I'm saying? That big of a change uh, would be too fast for the plants to adjust. All right, if you have something like that. So this is, again, there's a lot of study going into this. And, and like I mentioned, certain places like the Arctic, we're seeing tremendous climate change, very rapid. Other places, yeah, it's a climate change, but it's very slow, very, you know, minimal and slow. And just like anything, you know, if, if it's minimal and slow like that, there's there's a better chance to adapt for it, especially um, uh, for the plants. All right, another cool, we just got, um, we got a number of slides left here. Um, so I'll, um, why don't I take a break now? Let's answer some questions, then I'll, I'll get into this last part. So David, can you uh, read read them to me? Or I can pull up the chat, but if you read them, it might be easier. Sure. Um, so going back to the cherry blooms, um, it was asked, does the 20 year drop that that um, particular measurements showed, uh, does that track pretty well with what we see in other plants? I know you kind of mentioned, um, for example, with the oak trees and some of the other things, but is that um, kind of a consistent uh, window um, for the change? Oh yeah, it, uh, I, I would say in, in, in general the answer is no. <laughs> it's it's uh, that's the thing that, that's that's very um, frustrating with uh, to explain climate change it, is it's really dependent on the uh, on the local area and it's really dependent on the, the plants and animals in that local area. And um, so if you ever read some of, of Charles Darwin or think of the Galapagos Islands and all the different very variability you see amongst these closely set islands you know where the birds on one island their beaks are slightly longer because the plants on that island the flowering the flowers were a little bit more of a tube and they had to they had to get their beak further in you know this kind of thing um it's actually you know quite a bit of variability um so it's not consistent it's consistent um you know say relatively local areas you know maybe within 30 40 miles but almost like if you remember the slide I showed from Hayes County of, of just in one county, the variance, um, uh, uh, you know, when you have elevation changes. So any place where you have mountains, uh, West Texas, all the way to the, to the Western US. So unfortunately, no, um, yeah, you couldn't take, for example, what was happening in, in Washington DC and correlate that very well with Japan. There'd be, there'd be a difference. So we're seeing general trends, but um, I'd say for a lot of times, it's really more specific to the local area. Okay. 
Um, we also had uh, someone interested in maybe a little bit more information about the index that you talked about. It's the normalized difference vegetation index. Yes. That's what, okay. Right, right. So basically what it is, is we, we have satellite observations for that particular um, view that we're looking at. It's, it's almost, it's basically a visible image. It's like your eyes would see. But you have you have to scale the the, the greenness, if you will, right? <laughs> and that, you know, if you've ever been down to the Sherwin Williams paint store, <laughs> you know, how green is green? You know, it's one of those kinds. Of so they they've come up with the scale on it. If you if you just Google that, Google NDVI, I'm pretty confident you'll be able to find a website that that uh, that has more information on it, or else um, reach out uh, 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 through David or Stan, and I can send you something on it. But basically, what they've done is we have pretty good satellite records of that. I'd say going back to probably the late 70s. And so again, if you have these satellite images every year on a certain day, you can basically say like oh, on March 30th, what was the greenness or how, how many of the pixels, they're little, think of them as little little boxes, you know, just like the megapixels on your camera. How many little boxes were of color shade, let's say eight, you know, say you did the greenness from bright green being 100 and, and the darkest of dark green, almost black being one, you know, you'd say how many of them were like 84? And they basically just sort of count those up if you want to look at it that way or average them that way. Um, and, and then they, they, what's cool about it then is, is the ag extension people in, in all the states, agricultural extension at all the state universities, um, they actually do have similar to the guy with the lax, they have uh, research farms and they have just regular commercial farmers that send them information, actually go out in the field and check. And that's how they do the correlations then with it. Um, so we've, we've got pretty good records uh, on that. And like I said, I think you should, if you just uh, Google NDVI, we should have that available. I'm trying to think it's not, um, it's not our NOAA uh, weather service satellites that have that, though it's a different, I think it's the Landsat satellites, but uh, USGS may have that. But if you Google that, you should be able to find, you know, like what is NDVI or something, and you'll, you'll get to a good page. Like I said, if you can't find that, just, uh, just uh, contact me either directly or through David or Stan, and I can definitely get you some information on that. Okay, thank you. Um, we also had a question. Um, could the plants that are leafing out earlier uh, or that longer growing window um, help reduce CO2 levels or make a difference in that respect? That's an excellent question. Whoever, whoever gave it, good for you, <laughs> because now you know the complication. That's exactly right. So uh, if you want to think about it this way, let's, let's say we'll make the president of the U.S. tomorrow, okay? Uh, President Biden's going to step down for a day and let me be in charge. <laughs> if if we could plant, if you if you if you had, let's say, um, a, a think of West Texas, this large area with not many plants. Let's say we had a plant or or a number of plants that we could put in that were drought resistant and leafed out and maintained it, and then and then actually not only would they take that energy you know, to grow from the sun. So help cool the local temperature, but then also sequester is the fancy term for getting that carbon out of the air back into the, as they grow, right? As, as the plant grows. So yes, and there's some studies, I saw one um, this last year from England where it's exactly that kind of thing. And then what they've noticed is, is actually uh, kelp on the seabed floors. They've actually found that that kelp can grow. It was something crazy. I want to say like three feet a day, it, it, you know, during its peak. And the idea was, is, of course, there's way more ocean than there is land. And of course, in the ocean, you don't have to worry about water, right, <laughs> in the ocean. So they were saying that what you could do is plant a lot more of these kelp beds, um, you know, help them along a little bit. And that, and of course, that would, these kelps are huge because you think of the seafloor, some of them might be, I don't know, 50, 100 feet high, really huge. But that was, that was one concept that they were testing out in a, in a sort of a limited area there uh, off, the, off England. Um, so that's a that's a great question, and and exactly that's part of the you know the issue of climate change is okay we're we're seeing what we're seeing that's fine the, the question then is what do you want to do about it and as you know there's all kinds of things you know from electric cars to um, you know just you know um, better insulation on your house and and everything but that's an excellent example though of and, and of course you all would know this um, probably the master gardeners think of zero escaping right which is a big a big thing in our area you know not planting things that suck up a ton of water um, you know planting stuff that's more natural you know to the wild area but that, that's a great that's an excellent question i'm glad you brought that up because right that's a, an example of an adaptation where you know in other words if you planted those kind of things you could actually, you know, get the climate change maybe to stop or hold or and then maybe even reverse it, right? If you kept 
get that kind of, of course, you got to be careful there. If you planted too many of them and now we cooled the, the earth back down, then they might freeze and die. So maybe, maybe it's a balancing thing. But that's an excellent, an excellent point on that. Thank you. Um, and then we had uh, one more person mention um, that there were 60 species, maybe locally, that are out of sync with that mutual beneficial relationship with plants. Um, and that it's definitely worth looking into for everybody to, to read a little more about um, whether it's the temperatures changing those growing windows or other non-native plants having right. also different growing windows. Um, right. Right. Yeah. And, that, and then again, that that's that's the thing we're seeing with these in, invasive species. Well, invasive species is the term we use. You know, I, I mean, sounds like we're being prejudicial against them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not they were not native to the area is a better way to put it. Um, you know, I mean, there's 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 nothing necessarily wrong with. But but the thing is, a lot of times with these species, um, again, but that symbiotic, there's also a predator uh, situation. So in other words, in some case, in some places, I'll just give you the example most people know. You know, there's in a general area, there's about as many feral cats as there are feral mice, right? Because if there's too many mice, then the cats will reproduce and more cats and then they'll, you know, <laughs> you know, it's that kind of a balance. You know, think of like the, the, uh, the savanna there in, uh, in Africa, right? It's a balancing kind of thing between the lions and the zebras and whatever. So a lot of times with these invasive species, the problem is that there's no natural predator or, or situation to keep it under control. And then it starts to, to crowd out or take over um that balance that has developed you know over thousands tens of thousands of years who knows how long so that that's where we run into that kind of a problem is when you have something that gets introduced you know all of a sudden and there's just no reaction to it um you know with nature so right climate change is sort of forcing that a little bit just the fact that people are moving around so much um you know think of all the people that move into this area from other parts of the u.s you know who knows is the is the moving trucks come in is there some extra extra kind of seeds or pollen that got caught on the bottom part of the trailer and all of a sudden we've got some you know plant species here that's normal to california but not not normal to texas yeah so all, all this all this relates together and you can see sort of it gets it gets very complicated um in a, in in certain uh, in certain situations okay any more or should i go on um, you can go on and just to know okay. you've got about 20 more minutes. <clears throat> right, right. We're gonna be we're gonna be right on time. So um, this is an interesting slide that I that I, I found a, a number of years ago. So in Ireland, they've got this um, network of phenological gardens. Okay. And see one of them here, this number 14, they even named after JFK. Um, but if you ever go to Ireland, you could go visit one of these. And um, what's really interesting about these then is is they did it with the intent of, well, let's track the species and let's track the timing so we have this we have this good network. So some of the data from that, here's an example. Uh, actually, let's, uh, the, one of the observatories is Valencia, all right? And again, in 1970, the day of the year that that, that species, this uh, Fagus sylvat sylvatica, I guess, was, uh, was leafing uh, or unfold, the leaf was unfolding at least, was around day 120, all right? So it's around May 1st, okay? But notice now by 2010, just in 40 years now, we're, we're the average is maybe still running, but notice we're getting quite a few more days approaching day 100. So it's again, 20 days uh, twenty days earlier. Uh, here's an example um, of, of uh, a different uh, bud burst for this Betula pubescens. I think I said that closely, right? We got three different sites here. So the average, it, um, the average for the JFK site is this black line. And then the, the year to year is this sort of dashed line. So again, you see the change from day 105. Okay, so that would be the middle of March. Now it's, we're down around day 95, about 10 days. Notice that this Johnstown site, it's, um, it was a little bit earlier, but notice the, it's not as much of a change. And then at this Valencia site, again, notice there's been barely any change at all from maybe 92 to 90, two days. So again, it could relate to uh, the temperature of the local area, how close they are to the ocean. And of course, Ireland's all completely, you know, you're nowhere in Ireland's more than what, maybe a hundred miles from the ocean. So uh, the ocean effect could be quite strong if you're uh, right seaside versus if you're in the center center of the country. But again, you can see even for the same type of species that, that the, the change could be could be uh, pretty pretty different, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic among them. Uh, this slide's a little complicated, but I wanted to show you. So one of the things they've noticed is, again, where are birds 
wintering over. So there's all this text there. Basically, the light blue dot is where they wintered over in the 1960s. The dark blue dots where they wintered over in the mid uh, early 2000s. And then the temperature, this is again that average temperature change in the US. So let's just take an example here. Let's start up here in Canada here. The marbled merlet used to winter over here, and now it's wintering over way up almost in Alaska. I think that is Southern Alaska. Down in Texas here, notice that snow geese used to winter somewhat in our area. I'm sorry, yeah, somewhat in our area. And now they're more in Western Arkansas. Notice with all of these, they're moving north. All of these used to winter over places further south, and now they're wintering over further north. And the reason for that is, is because it's not getting as cold, they don't need to fly as far. And of course, migrating like that is a tremendous sink on your energy, right? That's a tremendous amount of energy to fly from Southern Canada to the US or wherever you're going. Um, so they're not going as far. So again, it's a big difference. You know, if you're a birder here in South Texas, a lot of birds that maybe used to come down in our area don't, don't make it here anymore. Look at this house pitch. We went from South Central Nevada all the way to Central Nebraska. That's a tremendous you know, change in range. Or this boreal chickadee, here's another one here in South, Southeastern Canada, Ontario all the way out to the western uh, prairies of Canada. So again, these kind of things people track. And, and this is the kind of thing where it's all kinds of people. It's not just, it's not people at the Weather Service. It's all the bird people, all the people that are interested in plants. There's people that are interested in, in migratory things. And, and just, I mean, there's all kinds of people looking at this, ecologists and ornithologists and you know biologists, all kinds of people from all kinds of different angles are looking and seeing, uh, seeing the same kinds of changes. Um, this is one that you may not think about, but uh, whales. So this is a big thing um, to view whales uh, anywhere they are. I know in Hawaii, but on the on the West Coast, again, they've got these observations. The whales tend to mate and, and calve down here in Baja, uh, Mexico. And then they just basically work their way north, you know, and they end up in Alaska and they're most of their feeding grounds uh, during the summer months. Again, that's a tremendous amount of energy to migrate that far. It's thousands of miles. But again, we've got observations like this that go back um, you know, into, into the maybe the 1500s or 1600s even in, in some of the spots of that kind of thing. <clears throat> some of the other shifts we've seen is the red fox has expanded uh, north. And now you can see if you're a red fox in the winter, that's not a good situation, right? You sort of stand out. But now because there's less snow, they're going north. Notice the Arctic fox, opposite problem. If you're the Arctic fox and there's no snow, you've got a problem. So instead of being further in the west, they're going more toward Atlantic Canada, um, because the snow basically is more persistent there than it is out, out in the western part. So you're seeing some changes like that. <clears throat> Again, one of these things with the timing, um, the Rocky Mountains have actually seen uh, about a one and a half degree, that's not a negative sign, I got to make an arrow out of that, it's a 1.4 degrees rise, or almost two degrees Fahrenheit in the last um, 25 years. The yellow-bellied marmots are now coming out of hibernation 38 days earlier. So here's the problem. If you come out 38 days earlier, just because the average temperature is warmer doesn't mean you can still have a colder outbreak or a late winter storm. So imagine you're some small little marmots been hibernating all winter. You're as about as low on, on food stores, calorie and, calories and fat as you can be, and you come out, and now this big winter storm comes. And you can see what happens. You may get wiped out. Um, robins, again, 14 days earlier, when I was growing up in Minnesota, our biggest sign there was when you saw the first robins uh, in the late, usually late winter, usually it'd be just after Valentine's Day, um, you know, certainly by Easter. But when you saw the first robins, you pretty much knew winter wasn't going to be for maybe another month because they weren't going to migrate that north unless there was enough basically food to support them at that point. But Snowmelt and plant flowering has not, even though the temperature has gotten warmer, the snowmelt and plant flowering hasn't necessarily changed. So in other words, there, the animals are reacting quicker, but the plants aren't. So again, you've got this problem where the birds show up and the plants haven't flowered yet, or the animals come out and the plants haven't leaved or flowered, and they got a problem. So again, it's one of these mismatches. This The other ones I was showing you was, was uh, somewhat more of the, the plant mismatch. Here, it's more of the, the animals. Um, mismatch other thing another cool thing to look at is phenology also isn't just plants or animals specifically so in sweden they've got this network of web cameras and a big deal they want there is what's the status of the snowpack how deep is the snow and when is it melted and so again you you can take these snapshots almost like the video i showed you at the start you take these snapshots day after day after day and over time you can see you know is a certain location are things 
Is the snow lasting as long as the snow is deep? You know, you can put like just a little measuring stick on the tree, you know, to, to see how deep it is. Really cool use of, of really low cost technology, right? I mean, there's basically internet everywhere now. And they're you're obviously putting up a webcam is no big deal, right? So I just like think this is really cool that somebody thought of that. A real simple kind of, you know, thing. You know, people didn't only need to go outside. And you, like I said, you just put a stick on the tree and, and see how deep the snow is. So that's a cool thing. Um, a big deal in Alaska, um, if you've ever lived there, no people in Alaska, is when the rivers uh, basically break up. So here's an example from uh, a pond in Alaska. Oops, hang on there. I got to stop that. There you go. So this is from a pond in Alaska. <clears throat> and you can see the change, same kind of thing. We just have a camera looking out over the lake. And you can see is the ice is basically melted off uh, over the lake. And this is a big deal called breakup. It's a big thing in Alaska because outside of Anchorage, Fairbanks, um, and, and sort of the southeast part of the state, most of Alaska, you can't drive to. There aren't roads. And so the, you can fly. Of course, flying is expensive. But the other way is people use boats. You know, there's a lot of good, good traffic um, on the rivers. But obviously, you're not going in a boat. If it's iced over, you go a snowmobile, snow machine instead. So this breakup is a big deal in Alaska uh, when that occurs. But again, we can now track that. So that's another you know, climate related thing. It's not necessarily the plants or the animals, but again, if you're, if you're an animal that relies on catching fresh fish, let's say, well, if it's iced over, you can't do that. But now once it's clear, you can. So again, you could, you could maybe track uh, how that would change. And there we've come to the end. This is my slide again. I thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, hopefully you found it interesting that the thing I like about this, again, for Master Naturalists is it really gets sort of the core of the course, right? You're really looking at nature, you know, and how nature interacts with humans and interacts with itself, you know, plants and animals. And, uh, and phenology is sort of the, the weather and climate look at things. And, and sunlight's another big thing, you know, I, meteorologists were expected to know a little bit of astronomy too. So sunlight, um, so I've talked a lot about temperature. Sunlight's a big driver of this. It's amazing how many, especially of, of uh, plant interactions, uh, just they, they have a sense of how long the day is. And again, um, that's what triggers you know, certain events. And, and then that's just due to seasonality of the, of the earth moving around the sun and the fact that earth's tilted. We covered that if you remember when back in the uh, intro class, but that's all I have. I'd be happy to take any other questions. Um, if anybody else has any questions, please put them into the chat uh, and we'll try to address them. Um, I did want to thank you, John, for uh, giving us this fantastic presentation. I learned a whole bunch. And uh, if anybody would like um, access to the slides, they can reach out to John. His contact information is there. They can reach out to us. Uh, at Phil Hardberger Park. Um, I did wanna mention to everybody, um, take a look at our calendar. We've got lots of uh, awesome programming coming up. Uh, we have uh, art in the park program. We have children's nature classes. Um, and next month, our fourth Saturday nature walk is going to be um, about area birds with the Bear and San Antonio uh, Audubon Society. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, John, was there anything else? No, that's it. I just, uh, y'all keep going. Eventually COVID's going to go away. And I know, I mean, to me, a big part of Master Access Program is, is getting out in nature. <laughs> so, so do as much as you can. I mean, that, that's, that's mostly safe, right? Um, and, and we got spring coming up. So, um, another couple of weeks of some cold weather here, and then, and then we'll be on to our normal, normal warm season. All right. Um, and I'll stay on uh, to to answer any other questions in the chat. Uh, but thank you, everybody else, uh, for joining us. And have a good weekend.